So I read a story not so long ago about a, a young guy, uh, early middle school, uh, and his dad who were going through his grandfather's things after his grandfather's funeral. Uh, they were up in the attic. They were both uh, seated on some little boxes, and they were going through boxes. And the grandson ran across a picture. He didn't fully recognize it, but he thought he did. So he asked his dad, I said, Dad, is this granddad? Dad looked at the picture, and he said, well, uh, I, I guess it has to be. It, it favors him a good bit. I guess that was him when he was much younger. So they kept looking, they kept looking, and then finally the grandson found another picture, and it had a, the, the guy, the, they were not quite sure if it was granddad or not, with an older guy, a guy just a little bit older than him that really looked like his granddad. He said, well, Dad, I'm not sure if that first picture was really granddad because I think granddad is here and he's with the other guy that we thought might be him. Dad got the picture and he looked at it and he goes, well, this is granddad. I, I know my father when I see him. So I'm not sure who this younger guy is, but he looks a lot like your granddad. So they started to investigate with other family members and what they discerned was that granddad actually had a little brother that had been estranged from the family, his son's entire life. And as a result, the family did not know that grandfather's brother, their uncle, existed. And now that they knew and grandfather was no longer with them, they really wanted to get to know the uncle, hoping he might be able to give a little, inform a little more information about some of their past. So the dad and the son got together and said, let's go see if we can find our uncle. The last known recorded address from another family member said that he lived about two states away. They made their way over, checked into a hotel, got their things settled, went out to grab a bite to eat, and while they were sitting in a local diner, the son said to the father, so where are we going to start? And the father said, well, I don't think we need to look any further. The son said, what do you mean? And he pointed outside the window, walking toward the cafe. He said, that has to be my uncle. And the son said, well, the resemblance is vague from the picture. He was so much younger then. How do you know that's your uncle? He said, I can tell by the way he walks. He walks just like his big brother. You know, the Bible would teach that the longer we walk with Jesus, the more people should recognize that we walk just like our brother. Last week, we started this series, Why Church? Answering why did God call us out of the world and make us into a distinct group of people? If you'll remember, we answered that question last week by saying evangelism uh, is the work of the church. God has called us out of the world so that we could reach the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to continue in that series and see that education is the will of the church. That walking with Jesus is built around information. Now, now let me explain what I mean by that. So, to follow Jesus means to make a choice to be what the Bible refers to as a disciple. A follower of Jesus is also referred to as a disciple of Jesus. Hence, we've been given the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, help people learn what it means to follow Jesus. Well, if you look up the word disciple in the original language of the New Testament Greek, it's methetes. And methetes literally is defined as pupil or student or learner or school boy or school girl. So to follow Christ is to become a lifelong student so that we can pour over the information that God has given us in his word that is designed to lead to transformation. So we don't study the information simply just to be more knowledgeable. We study the information so that it would lead to transformation and we would live a little more like Jesus. 
We'll see that in the text today, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11, 14, 11 through 14. And as we read the text, we're going to unpack it together and discover at least four things. Let's read the text first, starting Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not equated with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So if you would imagine this table analogously represents the church. If you'll allow for this morning, the table would be a picture of the church. And as we unpack this passage together, we're going to see as a part of the church or gathering under the umbrella of the church, there are at least four groups of people. So, so I'm going to ask you to ask the same question that, that obviously I asked myself as I was preparing this study is where am I at the table? Second question I ask, am I at the right seat in the table? Because as we work around the table, what you'll see is that while we all start in one seat, we're not called to remain in that seat. God moves his people around the table. It's kind of like when we were a kid, I don't know if you were like this, but in my home, when we would have a big family reunion, there was always the big people table, and there was the little people table. And I can remember when I graduated from the little people table to the big table. In a similar way, we start out in one of these chairs. But as we grow, God will often move us to another chair. We're going to see at the table that there are leaders. We're going to see that there are learners. We're going to see that there are those that are considered lazy. And we're also going to see at any given point in time when the church gathers, there are also laws that pull up to the table. Before we look at those, though, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the power of your word and your Holy Spirit whom you sent to teach us. Please use the information that we'll study today to lead us to more transformation in our life so that unmistakably we would walk like Jesus. Speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So at the table, I would say at the head of the table, there are leaders within the church. You, you say, where's that in the passage? Look with me again to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, the very first verse in the passage. Notice it says this, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make clear because you no longer try to understand. Look at the first part of that. We have much to say about this. When we're studying scripture, it's always important that we get the context. So if we back up, leading into Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, this is what we see. We see someone like a pastor teaching a Hebrew church about the priesthood of Melchizedek and that Jesus is our high priest serving today before the Father around the throne, interceding for us as our high priest. 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul tells Timothy, we have but one mediator between us and God, and it's Christ Jesus. He is our high priest. This is why when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Why? We're confirming that we understand it is only because of Jesus that we can approach the Father. He is our high priest. He is our mediator. He is our go-between. So the author of the book of Hebrews is teaching about Jesus being our high priest and in a specific order, the priesthood of Melchizedek, a person who lived long ago. You'll read about him in the book of Genesis. 
And then all of a sudden, the author slams on brakes and just stops. And he says, look, we've got a lot to say about it. But we can't talk about it right now because you're slow to learn. So what we see at the very beginning of this text is around the table or in the church, they're the leaders. They're those that God has called. He has anointed and he has appointed those leaders to help lead the vision of God for each local church. Those leaders oftentimes in churches of this size and as they grow would be the pastoral staff. But regardless of the size of church, the pastoral staff is also accompanied by high-capacity lay leadership. Lay people that have also been called by God and put extra time in study to serve in certain areas. In our particular church, we call community group leaders also what would fall in this category of leaders. Why? Because what they do is they take a smaller group of people from the table at large, the church, and then they go and they gather in a classroom and they open God's word and they teach and lead discussion around God's word. So leaders can be the pastoral staff, but can also be what we would call high capacity lay volunteers that have also committed their life to helping lead and teach in the local church. This is the pattern that was set forth with the Apostle Paul when he was explaining the governance of the local church to the church at Ephesus. R read with me Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Or write that down in your notes to go back and read later. Here's how it reads right out of the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4, 11 through 13. So Christ gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers... So these are leaders around the table. Now, what did he give them for? Look at verse 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13. To equip the people, that's everybody else at the table, for the works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So how does a local church attain the full measure of the fullness of Christ that God has predetermined for that church to experience. It's when leaders lead. It's when those within the church recognize that God has called them to give their life away in service to him in and through the local church, and they engage in the act of leading. This is why in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, it says, those who have the gift of leadership, let them lead diligently. God is called the pastoral staff, and those high-capacity volunteers to come alongside of the pastoral staff and to lead. Second thing, second group we see at the table. We see learned. We see leaders, and we also see the learned at the table. So if you look, every table should have leaders that are leading, but then they should also have learned that are soaking it in, and what happens is, over time, the learned often move chairs and move over to the leader chair. The learned sit, and they soak it in, and they soak it in, and grow to a point where eventually they serve, which means they move to the leader chair in a specific area of the church to ensure that the mission of God continues to move forward. You say, where do you see that? Look at verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So, so I underlined in my Bible, trained themselves. Trained themselves. Oftentimes, in the life of a believer, through his or her coming to faith in Christ and growing and growing, living and living until the Lord calls them home, oftentimes there are those who sit in a church and never really grow past a certain level. I submit to you, in most of those cases, it's because that individual never took personal responsibility to learn themselves. But if you look at the learned here, Sure, they benefited from the teaching of the leader, 
But that's not where the true growth came from. Where did it come from? Look at what it says again in verse 14. It said, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We must take personal responsibility of digging into God's word ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't come to church and be taught. We are to come to, we're, we have a place at the table, and that is to sit under the leadership of the church. But God will grow us and groom us, and he says here that most of them should have been teachers by now, but they're not because they were slow to learn. So we need to dig in to the scripture ourselves. I remember reading a, a comics a cartoon strip in Sally was getting ready to memorize verses so she could say it and get a little golden star from her Sunday school teacher. And she quoted a verse, and Linus said, well, where did that come from? She said, I can't remember the name of the book. She was trying to remember which book of the Bible it came from. And he said, come on, think, you can get it. And she quoted it again, and she said, oh, yeah, it's from the book of reevaluations." Now, Sally was trying to say it's from the book of Revelation, uh, the last book of the Bible. But what she said, we might need to consider on a daily basis. The book of reevaluation. How do we become a part of the learned and not the lazy? We open God's word on a consistent basis, and we reevaluate our life based on what God's word says. So when we look at God's word... And we look at our life, if they're not matching, the reevaluation is that we should change, not God's word. Because his word is timeless and it's immutable. That means unchangeable. It means it does not change. And it was ap applicable to us yesterday. It will be applicable to us in the future. And it is applicable to us right now. So around the table, we see leaders. We see learners. And then we see the lazy. You say, what do you mean the lazy? All right, look back in the passage. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. Listen to how it reads. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. So notice that the author is stating, we have much to say about this. They're leaders that are to teach God's word. And then he says, some have learned to train themselves to distinguish good from evil because they constantly use the scripture themselves. So we have to learn. But here we see that the author is pointing out that there's also lazy there. And you say, what do you mean lazy? Think about what the text said. By this time, it actually says, in fact, comma, accentuating what's getting ready to be said. By this time, you ought to be a teacher yourself. Saying so you ought to be able to dig into the meat of God's word and explain it to somebody else. But instead, you need milk. Notice that he says, if someone has been in the journey for a long time, they've been in long enough to be a teacher. And they're not able to dig into God's word themselves. It says they're not actually acquainted with the teachings of righteousness. What does that mean? Well, if you go back to chapter earlier in chapter 5, he was teaching on the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. If you fast forward to chapter 7, he starts teaching on that again. But he had to stop. So what he's saying is, you're not ready for this deeper teaching or that deeper teaching. I've got to teach you the elementary truths all over again. When you get home, you can read chapter 6, the first few verses. And he refers back to what the basic teachings are. And the basic teachings really revolve around just salvation itself. Now, don't hear me. Wrong. Salvation is vitally important. Without it, we don't know Jesus. And we need to regularly be reminded of the gospel itself. But we must grow past, at least in our knowledge, the gospel. In the sense that we need to understand some of the deeper truths of Scripture... One, so that it will benefit our own life, but two, so that we can help others understand what it means to live as a kingdom person. Because when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we become a part of a kingdom. We take our seat at the table as a part of God's kingdom, and we're called to walk like he walked.
My wife and I had the opportunity to sit with a young lady yesterday and talk a lot about the Bible, and she had numerous questions. And one of the things the young lady said that stood out to me that I've heard numerous times in 30 years of ministry is, I hear what you're saying, but in my experience growing up, those who called to church, those who were a part of the church, live no differently than everybody else in our neighborhood or everybody else in our city. Live the same way. What she was saying is, I didn't see people live out what they say they believed. I, I didn't see people who by constant use learned to distinguish between good and evil. Instead, I saw people who said religious things on Sunday and then lived like everybody else the rest of the week. That's what the author is addressing here. He's talking about spiritually lazy people who don't dig in themselves, nor do they apply what they learn. They have a little bit of head knowledge, but that information did not lead to transformation. Look at verse 11 again. Remember the author said, we have much to say about this. That'd be the leader. But notice the last part of verse 11. But it is hard to make clear to you because you no longer try to understand. That term, no longer try to understand. If you look at that in the Greek, it comes from a word that literally means dull of hearing. But the individual is not dull of hearing because the speaker is not speaking loud enough. The connotations of the word in the original language is that he's dull of hearing because he chooses not to listen anymore. Puts the choice on the listener, not the leader, as far as whether the listener will receive it. A leader can only do so much. The learned can only contribute so much to the process. The learner, at one point, has to take personal responsibility and appropriate that information and move toward transformation with God's help. But what the author is saying is there are some among you that are slow to learn. In other words, have become obstinate toward the gospel itself. And for whatever reason has chosen not to appropriate the instruction, therefore the information cannot lead to transformation because the person just won't let it happen. There's the leaders around the table. There's the learn around the table. And then there's the lazy around the table. The one that simply says no. Proverbs 28 verse 9 says this. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. We need to always ensure that we're open to God speaking into our life. If you get an electronic copy of the weekly each week, you know that I regularly write, this Sunday we will be talking about, and I'll put the passage, and then I'll say, please prayerfully read it before we come together. Why? What you take home on Sunday has less to do with what I deliver versus whether you were prepared to get what I delivered. I've heard people before Say, man, I didn't like what the preacher said today or I didn't get much out of what the preacher said. I'm talking about years ago when I was at the preacher on stage and I was privy to a lot of the conversations that take place after services like this. Well, let me hear you. There is a certain level of preparation that a pastor needs to do before he delivers a message. So some of the responsibility would bear on him, but not according to this text. In those that are slow to learn, why are they slow to learn? Because they choose not to listen. Because they choose not to receive. Don't be that person. So at the table we have the leaders, we have the learned, and we also have the lazy among us. This is a chair you don't want to camp in. We've all been there. Don't camp here. Move there or here. Wherever God's calling you as you increase in your learning, move into leadership as he leads you. There's a fourth chair. We technically don't see it in the passage at hand. But we see it in the whole of the canon, and that is that the lost are among us. Remember last week? Remember when Jesus led Levi to faith, and he went into Levi's home, and he sat down, and he continued to teach? Do you remember what the text, who the text said was there there in Mark chapter 2? It said sinners and tax collectors. Why were they there? They wanted to learn. 
How do we become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? We first have to learn what the gospel itself says, that Jesus is God's Son, who is the Son of God, who left heaven and came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, and was raised from the dead. We must learn this from the Scripture and appropriate it in our life before we can be saved. So at one point, we sat in a church service loss, or we sat at a friend's house loss, or we sat in a class loss, and somebody taught us the truth of the gospel itself. And then when we learned it, hopefully, we moved to the learn chair, and God grew us up, and then we moved to the leader chair so that we could help serve in the church. So loss will always be among us, and loss should be invited to participate in much of what we do. Now, a lost person is not to be baptized. Baptism is an ordinance within the local church for those that have recently placed their faith in Christ. Somebody gets saved. So now they're a learned person. They've learned and appropriated the gospel. So now they're baptized and they grow up in their faith, continue their learning process till they're ready to lead. A lost person is also not invited to participate in communion. Only saved people are to participate in communion. When we have communion, we always give a, a, a warning at the beginning. Hey, if you don't know Jesus, this is technically not for you. Even so, we would say if you know Jesus but aren't really walking closely with the Lord, until you get your heart right with the Lord, don't come because the Bible teaches that communion is for the saved and also those that are walking clearly with Jesus at the time. But outside of those two things, we don't see the Bible teaching that lost people can't come and be exposed to the community of Christians. They need to be because this is how they learn how Jesus lives and how he calls us to live in light of him. So when we look at the church in the New Testament, we see four primary groups of people. We see leaders, those that God anoints and appoints to help ensure that people understand his word and live in a way so that the church and the individual, we could maximize our redemptive potential as God's chosen people in the world today. And then there's also the learned, those that come alongside the leaders and help make sure we feed everybody that comes to the table. And then there's the lazy. And if we're honest, we've all been in this at one time or another. And this is when we just get too busy for God and kind of go our own way. And then there's the loss where we all were, if we know Jesus today, at one point. And that's where we came just to kind of check Christianity out and figure it out. So this is the picture of the church. So how do we make sure we're in the learned chair or in the leader chair that God calls us to be and not find ourselves in the lazy chair and, and Lord willing that you're not in the lost chair. How do we do that? I heard a story a while back. There was a business leader. He owned a soap manufacturing company. He was walking with his pastor after they had enjoyed a coffee together in a local coffee shop. And as they were making their way down the sidewalk, the business leader noticed a guy had just ran out of a convenience store with a gun. He had just held them up. Then he noticed some homelessness over here, and then he noticed a, looked like a husband and a wife, could have been a boyfriend or girlfriend, fighting just outside of the coffee shop they had just left. And as the business leader looked around at all of this sin around him, he said to the pastor, so pastor, do you think the Bible really works? Because I'm looking around and all I see is sin. Pastor thought for a minute. And he noticed over in the park, down the street, there was a little boy playing in the mud. And he had a uh, mud pile all over his face and dirt all up his arms. And the pastor said, huh, you notice that little boy in the park? He's as dirty as they get. You think that soap you are making in your manufacturer, in your company, you think that soap really works? And the guy thought for a moment, he said, well... Soap only works if you use it. And the pastor said, that is also true about the Bible. The Bible only really works if you use it. I'm going to give you four things really quickly to help you better use the Bible on your own so that when you come here, you're prepared to receive whatever God might have for you. 
And the acronym will be real easy to remember because it spells SOAP. S-O-A-P. And if we will use this SOAP daily, God will clean us, clean our lives up in a way that will be good to move the vision of the church forward and it will also be best for us. Because what's best for us when we're living the clean life that God's called us to live? So here's the S. Scripture. Get up every day to the Scripture. Get up every day to God's Word. Read His Word daily. If you go back and you study Jesus' earthly life, right before He ascended into heaven, there's what's called the high priestly prayer. It's listed in the Gospel of John chapter 17. And in verse 17 of John 17, we read this. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Well, if you look up the word sanctify there that Jesus prayed for you and prayed for me, if you look up the word sanctified, it means to become holy or, or, or to become like Jesus. It means for us to learn to walk like Jesus did. Well, how are we sanctified? He said by his truth. And then he said his word is the truth. So we have to get into scripture. And when we get into scripture daily, we're on the way to cleaning our life up in a way that would honor God. Second thing, observe. Observe the scripture. Observe what you're reading. The Bible was written to a group of people a long, long, long time ago. The first thing we need to do as we're reading through the scripture is observe what the text actually said. There are certain places where God spoke to Moses, God spoke to Noah, fast forward, God spoke to Paul, God spoke to Peter. We need to look and observe what God said in that day. And as we begin to understand what he said then, then we might be able to understand what he's saying to us today. We need to take the attitude of the psalmist in Psalm 119, 18. He said, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. So as we open the scripture each day, we need to pray as we make our observations. God, help me observe rightly. Help me observe correctly what you said in the past when you wrote whoever it is he was writing at the portion we were reading. Ask the questions, what, when, where, who, how. And as we discover that, we can make sense out of what the word said. Third thing is application. We need to get in the scripture. We need to apply the word or, or observe the word. Then we need to apply the word. And that's where we ask God, how can we apply it in our life today? After we observe, we learn what it said. As we look toward application, we're asking God, what does it say? Because of what it said to Moses or Noah or Paul or Peter or David, whoever in the past, because of what you said then, now what are you saying today? How can I apply this now? Brings me to Romans 12 and 2. The book is not purely about information. It's about transformation. That's why Paul said, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, get in the book, get in the book, get in the book, get in the book. And as you get in the book, the Spirit of God will help you apply it to your life because the information will lead to transformation, which ultimately means that we'll walk more and more like Jesus, the way God designed for us to do. The final one is pray. So we get in the Scripture, we observe the text, and then we ask for help applying the text. And prayer is just a confession that we can't do it on our own. It is impossible for us to truly learn the scriptures. That means gain the information and appropriate the same. It's impossible for us to really do that in a way that would honor God and also be good for you and me without his help. So prayer, we must bathe our life and our learning in prayer. The Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 4 and 2, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. When we do this, the soap will clean us up and help us live exactly the way God calls us to do. One last thing uh, before I close in prayer. Hold on just a second. 
Some of you have may, may already have seen this off to the side and thought, so what is the high chair for? So let me tell you what it's not for. Last service, somebody said, oh, no, Sean and Bonnie are expecting a new baby. No, <laughs> we are not. <laughs> we are grandparents and love it that way. Uh, we're not expecting another child. So what is this? So in the text, this chair is not really there. But in reality, if we're not careful, this chair creeps up in every church. And you say, what do you mean? Don't we want babies? Yeah, that would be those that are still in the infancy process of the learning stage. So this is technically not a high chair in the illustration. This is an eye chair. And an eye chair is when we come through the doors, not looking of, not considering what we might do to help honor God and serve the community as he's called us to, but we walk through the doors with that unholy trinity in our mind, me, myself, and I. I came to church just so I can get something. I came to church because I want the, kind of, I want the music to be exactly the way I like it. I didn't like that sound today or that the pastor talked too long or he didn't talk long enough or he didn't wear a tie or he did wear a tie. Oh my goodness, the things that we hear in churches. And those things that we usually hear come from a very selfish spirit. In the text, he said to the lazy, by this time you ought to be teachers. What if we walk with Jesus 20, 30, 40 years and we're still in this chair. That's not a good look. I actually thought I would sit in it and illustrate it, but I, I, I don't think it'll hold me up because they weren't designed to hold people up my size. That's why I say the eye chair doesn't really belong at the table. Confession and we close. I've been in the eye chair before. Even as a pastor, I've been in the eye chair before. I want to encourage you, if you find yourself in the eye chair, go before the Lord and confess it and say, God, I understand it's not about me. It's about glorifying you and build others up as you lead me to. And when we do those things, we get exactly what we really want, and that's peace in here. Because the greatest level of peace we ever experience is when we're walking in the center of God's will. And we're walking in the center of God's will is selflessly, not selfishly.